Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mastrius. Come on in, grab a seat, and make yourselves at home. I'm Julie DeBoer. I'm a professional artist. I'm one of the founders of Mastrius. I'm also a member at Mastrius Receiving Mentorship. And this is one of our live recordings of our podcast, The Artist Diaries, Digging Deep Beyond the Palette into the life and art of master artist Liz Adams. If you're new to Masteries, we're so happy you've joined us. Masteries is a supportive and non-competitive community where growing artists receive monthly mentorship from their choice of master or professional artist. We do everything in small groups and together in our large community in these weekly events, like today's chat with Liz. I'm really excited to introduce her to you. She is a Georgia-based, New York-trained, Paris, or no, I should say Georgia-raised, New York-trained and Paris-based fine artist. Uh, while she calls herself a figurative painter, you can't miss her still lifes, florals and landscapes. Everything she paints is full of depth and lush with curiosity. You don't have to take my word for it. Her work pulls international attention. She has held residencies in New York and Vietnam and has was granted a talent visa to live in France based on her artistic achievements. Her new home of Paris may be her inspiration for her new delightful and delicious series of macaroon paintings that tantalize the eye and appetite. She has taught at the Art Center and Art Students League of New York and now works closely with artists and mentorship online with us here at Masteris. And we're so thrilled that she's joined our team of mentors. How are you, Liz? I'm great, Julie. Thank you so much for having me tonight or today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's tonight for Liz and it's lunchtime for me. Um, so good to have you, good to see you. And um, before we jump in, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Julie DeVore, I'm a professional artist. I do a large whimsical acrylic landscapes. And um, as I said, I'm one of the founders. I'm being mentored currently at Masterius, and I am also mentoring aspiring artists as well, which is uh, really, really enjoyable. Um, I'm going to stay on this event after the chat is done, just so you know uh, to talk more about Masterius if anyone is interested in learning more about what we're doing and how to get connected in our supportive community. And as always, folks, please use the chat. Uh, put your questions, comments, stories, uh, in the chat, toggle it to everyone so we can all see your uh, questions and remarks. And I will moderate those questions as we go. Also, after the event, I'm going to give away a one month events membership to a non member. So stick around for that chat afterwards and we'll give one of those away. All right, that's all the business. So Liz, it's good to see you. It's good to connect with you. Uh, I'm excited to dive in. Yeah. How about, yeah, you bet. Um, how about you start with a little bit about you and uh, who you are, a bit about your journey of, of how you find yourself in France uh, today? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm very excited. I just celebrated my two-year anniversary here, and I also wow. got it, my visa extended for two more years. So. Oh, great. Congrats. Good news. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah it's... Um, it's definitely not anything that I planned a long time ago to, to live in Paris. I always kind of had this idea of Europe would be a fun place to end up. Mm -hmm. um, but I did spend a long time in New York, which was wonderful. I went to art school at the Art Students League, yeah. and I really dove into my work there um, and just loved New York. It was really inspiring. But uh, after many, many years there, I felt like I was looking for a life change. And it just dawned on me that I had the, a moment in life where I kind of had the flexibility and the um, bravery, I guess, or the foolishness. I don't know. It's a bit of both. <laughs> bravery, but bravery. Where I thought, yeah, I thought, well, why not try living in a foreign country? So I was actually planning to move to Berlin and I spent some time there and it's a beautiful city, but it didn't resonate with me artistically in the same way that Paris did. Paris, the aesthetic here just really um, I find so much inspiration in the architecture and 
mm. the uh, just the natural beauty of the, the there's so many beautiful parks and gardens and there are flowers everywhere and the French know how to really celebrate beauty and it's a it's a culture that um, really kind of holds the tradition of uh, artists that have come before and a mm. lot of my heroes have studied here at some point you know from art history so anyway it just kind of uh, fell in my lap gradually, I'll say. I had okay. a friend who, who was uh, from France and I had known her many years. We reconnected in New York and she invited me to come stay with her family for a couple of months and really try out France. And she lives out, right outside of Paris. So I did that in 2019 and just the more time I spent here, I just really fell in love. So after mm -hmm. that, I decided to, to make the plunge and apply for the visa, so. Yeah, and that's, I had never even heard of a talent visa, so that is really exciting that there is such a thing to begin with. Well, it's interesting because I hadn't heard of it either. I actually applied for a different visa. I was just planning to do a self-employed visa. Um, my, my lawyer, I had an immigration lawyer help me, and he said, you know, unless you're really famous, I don't think you're going to get this visa. Uh -huh. So I was like, all right. So I applied for the self-employed visa. And the French government decided I was well renowned, and I was very excited. So um, it felt like a big honor. Um, so yeah, it's it's something that's relatively new, this visa. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 quite a um, it's an honor, and it's also like a commitment to the culture because part of my visa it re it requires installation in France, and they want to see me connecting with French associations, with French organizations. Um, so I love that because it kind of gives me that push to really immerse here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, become part of the of the culture, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah. Painting it. So you're memorializing your experience there. I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm finding a lot of inspiration in unexpected places. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's great. Will you ever come back to North America? Well, you know, I'm not sure. Like, I, I do have family. I have my sister and my brother, and my brother has small children. Mm -hmm. So I know there's always a pool to spend time in the U.S. Ideally, I would love to be able to be between places, you know, be able to be in the U.S. part time sure. and, and based in France. So that's kind of something I'd like to work towards mm -hmm. because I think the two cultures, um, there's really great benefits to both. And uh, But right now, I just kind of see myself here, and I really just embrace that fully so yeah no yeah. that's good um wonderful tell us a little bit about um your journey of becoming an artist um I always find that's that is so unique to each person uh, that I hear I oh. love hearing that yeah okay yeah so I always loved art when I was younger um I think um in second grade you know we had this um, career day and you dressed up the way you saw yourself as an adult and I had a, a beret of all things so I guess I had a premonition <laughs> about Paris but I had a little wooden palette and I was you know I'm going to be an artist mm. but something as I got older I think I became um, I, I didn't have the confidence and I um, second guessed my work and I just became kind of hard on myself and I just decided I didn't have the natural talent Okay. And so as a teenager, I would kind of try to draw and then I'd get frustrated and hard on myself and just, you know, say, no, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And finally, when I was 18, I um, took a, a very small private, it was a private class, but there were three of us students okay. and it was an oil painting class. And I did this still life of white roses. And my teacher was just so lovely. And so uh, he, he shared his knowledge so beautifully and I remember the first day he took us to an art supply store in Atlanta. And I just remember walking into, it was Pearl Paint, um, and, which is no longer in business now. But um, anyway, I just remember seeing these rows of brushes and smelling the oil paints. And I just had this thought like, this is gonna be my life. Wow. And I just fell in love from the minute I first started painting. And after I finished that painting of the white roses, which my mother had on her wall for many years. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought this is how I want to spend as much time as possible. Mm -hmm. And that was many years ago. And that is what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah. 
So, was it a tough? Yeah. Was it, so yeah, obviously ups and downs. Um, courage yeah. and, and encouragement, uh, huge parts of getting started. Was your family very uh, supportive? Did they want you to go that direction, pursue your, your dream? Well, they were very supportive of my work. They they you know hosted art shows in their house, and my parents were just um, the kind of parents who showed up for all your events. They were wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm super grateful for them, and um, they have both passed away. So I I always um, just you know, I think you have even more gratitude later in life for, for your parents. Um, but yeah, so they were very supportive in that way. However, I grew up in a, a really um, conservative environment and they were kind of scared of me going to art school. So that was not really what they were thrilled about. So I did uh, get a, a degree from a local college, Georgia State University. Um, but then later, I once I was a little bit older, I was like, you know, I really need to go to New York, and um, that's that's what I did. And by that time, they were acclimated to the yeah, idea. Yeah, but it did take some time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I have one of those degrees as well that I never used. <laughs> well, my, in mine was it was a fine art degree, but I oh, still okay. felt like I I didn't you know quite learn how to paint in the way I wanted to it was much more of a conceptual school in fact um I don't think anyone from Georgia State is on this zoom so I will say this but um there was a big debate in my senior year because I was doing Dutch still life and there, the big debate was is Liz's work actually art oh. because it was traditional <laughs> oh wow <laughs> and I just at the time, it was like horrifying, and I was like, "What? I think it is. I think it is. It. I think so." <laughs> and now I'm just like, yeah, I can laugh about it, but uh, yeah. So it was not the best fit for me. But then, of course, I found uh, I found other teachers in New York and other places that were were great. So, mm -hmm. well, and you bring up a good point. So you're you're classically. Uh, trained but looking at your artwork it's it's much more modern uh tell me a bit yeah. about about that transition or or your voice yeah. coming through what what's that all about yeah so you're you're exactly right um I do have a very classical background so I I spent five years at the art students league drawing and painting from life every day six days a week um I studied anatomy I took an anatomy course at a um a medical uh college um, that was led by an artist. Uh, so we kind of joined the medical students um, to observe the ca cadavers and draw yeah. and learn yeah. the muscles. So I have all of this wonderful background, which I'm so grateful for and so grateful for my teachers. Um, so I really learned to um, understand the human form and just um, develop such an appreciation and a love of painting people and emotion and uh, reality. Uh, reality as I'm experiencing it. So when I got out of uh, art student, the Art Students League, you know, I'd been in this very structured environment for many years. And to this day, I still work on timers. <laughs> um, oh, wow. we, we had 20 minute poses, five minute breaks. You know, that was kind of how you worked. And I still work that way. So oh, okay. um, yeah, it's, even though I'm not always having a model pose. Um, but anyway, when I got out of school, um, you know, it's a hard transition from school to professional Art, being a professional artist, mm -hmm. and I felt quite lost. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, you know, I'm going to go back to the basics and I'm going to spend a whole year drawing only, working in black and white, oh. which is very far from what I do now. Um, but it really grounded me in what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started drawing my face a lot. I started drawing my face in emotional poses. Um, and, you know, many years later, I'm painting singers because I think I like seeing the face uh, and expressions that you don't expect in, mm. in painting. Mm. So it's definitely a journey, but as I, as much as I appreciated my school, as I got further from it, I started to find different symbols that I was resonating with, things in art history that I could borrow from, things that I loved. Um, and over the last, um, goodness, I would say the last six years, my style has become freer and looser. And part of my journey in Paris has been really tied to that because I'm really embracing it fully to let myself um, dive into the color palette and the, the, the subjects that appeal to me, that call me, that I'm inspired by. Mm -hmm. I recently was critiqued for using too much pink 
in my work. Uh, <laughs> I'm an artist. And um, I just kind of pocketed that. And then I named my next show, which is opening next, this weekend in Paris, La Vie en Rose. So life <laughs> Because I was like, I don't think there's so too much thing is or there's no, no such thing too much pain. No, so, no. you know, sometimes I can use the things that are a little bit of a challenge to turn it around. It helps. But um, yeah, so I think my, my iconography is constantly developing, but I think what's beautiful, and I tell my students this, is we all have a voice. You don't right. necessarily have to struggle to find it. It will come out. Right. And it, it just takes time and creation and kind of a, a non-attachment where you can let it ebb and flow but it's mm. in you like nobody's work is ever going to look the same so mm. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I totally agree um yeah tell, tell us a little bit about you finding your voice you you already kind of commented on that uh, I'm, no. I'm amazed I'm amazed that you took a year to do black and white drawings to build yeah. a foundation that's really impressive um tell tell us a little bit more about how you nurtured your voice out of you okay. and what it is that you are saying with your voice. Yeah, so I think um, one thing that really helped me is I started painting, um, I think it was around 2008, I started doing a lot of plein air painting mm -hmm. and painting on site, responding to something in the moment, it became a more um, intuitive approach to painting and less academic because you simply don't have the time in um, plein air, you know, you have to really uh, reduce things to their uh, basic elements and your impression. And so my painting started to really loosen up at this point as I started painting in the plain air. And I started to realize I actually like the plain air work better than I do on something that I spend, you know, 50 hours noodling <laughs> something. Wow. So I, I realized the spontaneity is something good to capture. Yeah. And part of my journey has been able, has has been about learning how to figure out what kind of reference I'm using and how to make it feel spontaneous. Because I do use photographs a lot. I have to uh, for many reasons. Often the people that I am painting are in um, really extreme, you know, weird poses with their mouths. Sure. Um, also, I'm now at this point making up a lot of the people. So there's this combination of like using photos, using my imagination that you know, I've kind of gotten away from the way that I was trained, but that foundation helped me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say that probably one of the best things for me has been doing studies. Um, whenever I have an artist block, and I've had a few in my life, um, I'm coming out of one recently, and I'm excited to see what's going on. Um, it, there's just something about going back to like a small scale, and just working out ideas with no pressure. Um, and so there's something intimate. It's almost like a visual journal. You know, you just express something in the moment. Um, and that really helps me tap into what resonates with me. And sometimes what doesn't, you know, like if I'm trying to force myself to do something that I painted for two years and I'm tired of it, but I'm still thinking I'm supposed to be doing it for some reason. Right. Um, you know, there's this, I can see that in my work and then it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's it's lacking the energy, which mm. means, you know, it's time to open up to something else. Uh, so studies are just really a great way, I think, to explore, you know, your voice. Mm. Yeah. I love that. And I, I resonate with um, the idea that you're painting the same thing you've been painting for years and that it, that it shows up in your work when you are, when it becomes more of a a chore or a job right doing the same thing yes exactly um in new york um probably around 2015 i was doing 2014 15 16 i was doing really big heads like huge portraits six feet tall it was super fun i was so engaged i loved it um they were getting some attention and they were selling and it, it was great and then i started to feel like i was like the big head lady. That was like what I was getting labeled. And, <laughs> and there's something about like, once I have a label, I'm like, oh, then I can't do that anymore. Oh, and, good. <laughs> but it's, it's not just like a rebellious thing. I think sometimes you just have an idea and you work it out and you work it out for a few years and then you're just artistically ready to move on to something different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always good to give ourselves that freedom um, yeah. to, to continue the journey, to continue changing and growing, evolving. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of the beauty of, of being an artist because you're never going to arrive at this 
one place, the plateau, there's always more. Yeah. Yeah, that's so encouraging. I I know I have felt pigeonholed, although I did it to myself as a landscape painter. And now, uh, thanks to kind of mentorship and, and working with artists like you, that I'm I'm getting pushed and encouraged to, to continue to explore and to yes. push out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what are you saying with your artwork? I, so kind of two-part question. What yeah. you, just mentioned, you mentioned paintings, um, it's like sing, people who are singing, which I've seen mm-hmm. your work, which I love, and I and the energy is so there. What is the message? What are you hoping people are getting from your work? So I would say the, um, you know, I used to just say my work was about tapping into the emotions of my subject, which it mm-hmm. still is. Um, but to me, my work is really becoming about joy. Um, and imagination Mm -hmm. and so my paintings um, I mean I just find we're in a really hard moment in life there's so many things going on in the world that are difficult to process there's so much suffering Um, but I think there is this call to beauty um, that is important to to honor and pay attention to and I think um, as an artist for, for me it's a really important part of my work is to celebrate beautiful things Mm-hmm. and to celebrate the imagination. And interestingly, I find imagination is, it makes me think about children or being a child. Um, so uh, there's something playful too that's coming out in my work. Um, yep. And like even my series of sweets, I started it because it was the beginning of the pandemic and it was a stressful time. I was back home with family between uh, my international move. And I was thinking back to what comforted me as a child, what brought me joy. Oh. And I started thinking about candies and sweets. Yeah. And so there's something about imagination, childhood, hope, mm-hmm. creativity. You know, these are the themes that my work is really evaluating. And part of the reason I do singers is because it's it's people using their voice. And I think that's a symbol for what painting is about or creativity is about using your own voice. Yeah. and creating your own song. Um, I don't sing, but I sure paint singers. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's a visual song. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a lovely way to put it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, all right. So uh, do you know where you're going from here as far as uh, what where you're, where you're exploring uh, subject-wise? Yeah, I'm really... Um, well, you know, I've got this iconography with you can see some of my stuff, but I'm I'm painting a lot of um, a lot of blues, a lot of underwater. It's kind of representing the unconscious and kind of mm-hmm. tapping into your imagination and your creativity and kind of a sense of wonder. Um, so with the underwater, I do you know jellyfish and koi, kind of strange fish. Also bubbles. I'm I'm doing a lot of bubbles and a lot of circles. And I started to write about what's because I also do a lot of writing. And I was thinking, what what is up with bubbles? Because they're in all my paintings right now. (laughs) And I think my artwork has felt like my bubble. It's my way to deal with being in this reality that we're in. And Mm -hmm. I feel it more strongly now than ever as I'm getting older and the world feels like it's getting crazier. I really need to be in my bubble, which is my place of creativity. And it's also a bubble is very transient. Um, it, you know, it pops very quickly. It's very, it's delicate, mm. um, but it also reflects what it, what is, what's it, what it's around, its surroundings. So to me, the bubble is very symbolic. Um, so those, you know, I'm de- developing my symbols over the years. That's part of it. But right now I am very excited because I'm drawing on art history a lot. Like I'm diving into some painters that I studied when I was in school um, either in, in college studying art history or just in school at Art Student League, I was constantly looking at the old masters. Um, I had an opportunity to study Renaissance art history in Italy one summer um, while I was studying. So I'm kind of going back to some of these subjects. Like I have something recently, I'm kind of looking around for it. I don't know which where it is. Oh, it's this one. I don't know if it's okay if I pull out a painting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Please. So this is a, a current painting, um, and this is a Madonna that is based um, loosely off uh, Fra Lippi, who was a Renaissance uh, Fra. I think it was Fra Filippo Lippi. 
Mm. And I saw his works um, in many years ago in Florence. And so I kind of used the Madonna, but made her my own and put her in my own environment and kind of my own mythology. And it's this kind of contemplative prayerful piece, but with my symbols of, of joy and creativity. Um, mm. So yeah, this is something I'm excited about because I like the fact that we can all draw on each other through this art history, you know, we're all part of it. Yeah. So it, it's very holistic. So yeah, that's kind of something I'm exploring lately. I also, um, I love statues, statuary. Hmm. Um, and in France, there are many statues and fountains. So I'm kind of observing those. Um, so some of the work behind me here has a statue. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's this element of drawing from the old, but putting it in my own. 2022 context, context, you know, of like my colors, my world, what mm -hmm. draws me. So yeah, it's um, that's a long answer. I don't. I hope it's <laughs> somewhat. Can, can yeah, I absolutely. <laughs> no, I love that. I love how you're pulling. You're pulling and pushing at the same time, and uh, bubbles and, and what that means to you about uh, it being your safe place, but delicate mm -hmm. and reflecting mm -hmm. the environment around you. That's yeah, yeah, beautiful. I I had of course I'll look at bubbles differently from now on. Really beautiful. Oh, cool. Um, I'm having this show on uh, that's opening on Saturday, and at the we call it opening in France. You call it a vernissage. Mm -hmm. So at the vernissage, I'm gonna have bubbles all over the gallery so people can blow bubbles. <laughs> oh, fantastic! That's yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Make it fun, exactly. <laughs> Uh, um, all right. How about your self portraits? I know uh, I've seen one of you standing in front of a giant uh, self portrait. I think that one was yeah. and about um, your self portraits and about becoming an artist uh, okay. and, and versus performing that kind of that whole piece for you. Yeah. Um, so my self portraits. I really started doing them when I got out of school. I think I mentioned I did this year of drawing mm -hmm. and I did a lot of self-portraits that year. Mm -hmm. And I was so used to working from life, you know, six days a week with models. Like it was just a lot of working from life, which was a total privilege. And I'm mm -hmm. so thankful. Um, and I still love working from life. But I, I just kind of found myself in a position with um, not a lot of money for models. I wasn't in school. I was like, well, you know, I'm here, got a mirror. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I started doing a lot of self-portraits. And there was a year that I had some health problems and some things going on in my personal life. And I was really struggling. So I actually documented the sadness in the portraits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was really powerful for me to feel like I could express myself mm -hmm. visually when I wasn't exactly maybe talking to a lot of people about what was going on in my life, because mm -hmm. I can be a bit private about things. Um, and, you know, to document that in portraiture was, was really powerful. And so over the years, my self portraits, I try to do at least one big one a year, um, just to kind of keep track of where I am artistically, but also on my personal journey. Um, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. I had never thought of, that's funny as it being art therapy for yourself as you're processing yes. pain or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or even, you know, I mean, I do have quite a few sad self-portraits and I have one that's like kind of at the beginning of the pandemic and I have this kind of deer in the headlights expression. <laughs> but then I have, I have one that's kind of when I was waiting to go to France, but I was back home in Georgia, which I hadn't lived in Georgia for 15 years. So it was like this weird in between. And I kind of did this self-portrait of me coming out of a flower. So it was like this really reawakening but kind of getting in touch with my roots but I'm also about to start a new life so there was this very something about the the symbol I used an iris um I love to look at the language of flowers and iris means um it can it can mean like a renaissance or a rebirth mm. and that was something I was really feeling at that time so yeah it's it, it's it's cool to document yourself and to use symbols for it and it also ends up helping me find my symbols and find mm -hmm. things that colors that work for me. Um, I did when I did the self portrait at the beginning of COVID, um, I used a, a beautiful blue turquoisey background. And since then you can see there's turquoise a lot. Um, so yeah, it, it's a cool part of the journey. 
Mm. How do you balance um, the demands of being a professional artist uh, with like the, the becoming, because you, you continue to talk about that you're, you're still obviously growing mm -hmm. and pursuing. Um, how do you balance that with the, the, um, the practical sort of, I, you need to produce, you need to be, you have shows coming, uh, this yeah. is a, a career for you. How do you do those two well? Oh, it's so hard because I tell you what, to be perfectly honest, the only time I actually think I'm working is when I'm painting, but that is just not true. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, if I could, I would paint 40 hours a week and then somebody else would manage everything. Yes. <laughs> but um, it doesn't work that way. So you have to, um, I, I just have to kind of really be mindful that um, in order to get to do what I love, I have to put in the administrative time. Mm -hmm. And I just tell myself that a lot. And sometimes this is kind of funny. I'll put on the top of my to-do list because I'm a little calendar, manual calendar kind of girl. I'll put on the top of the list, be an adult. And that reminds <laughs> me that, yes, I know you love painting and all you want to do is go paint, but you have to get the administrative stuff done or you're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> be an adult. Yeah, words to uh, live by, I guess. <laughs> Yes. And, you know, I, I mentioned I work on timers. I work on timers for the administrative staff, too. And I am a big fan of treats, like rewards. Like, you know, I if I work for 30 minutes, I'm like, you get a cup of tea. Or <laughs> if I knock out two hours of administrative stuff, I get to take a walk. Nice. You know, I just try to make it as I try to make it a little less odious. Um, some administrative tasks are fun, like communicating with students is, is not a chore, but, you know, I don't know, doing your taxes or balancing your, <laughs> you know, accounts or, you know, searching online endlessly for new opportunities, <laughs> like some of it can be a drag, so you have to make it fun. <laughs> I love that. That's not it. It's, it's good. Um, I'm all for rewards and I'm seeing some comments up uh, as well. Heather said Re rewards are awesome. And hey. uh, <laughs> oh, another, com another comment from Cindy. Bubbles have appeared in some of my pieces too, but I never thought about them in quite this way. I was thinking about them in a whimsical, fun and playful way, but now I see them differently. Thanks for sharing your meanings about your symbols as it makes me think more about the symbols that appear in my work. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so cool, Cindy. Keep up mm -hmm. the bubbles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, me too. I, I thought of bubbles differently, but yeah, actually it's ripe with meaning. Uh, it lovely. is, yeah. yeah. So I'm curious about, you mentioned painter's block that you've had that mm -hmm. a few times. Tell me about that, yeah. So usually it's when I go through a huge difficult life change, um, mm -hmm. you know, either losing someone or a relationship ending. Um, it really shuts me down artistically. I'm super sensitive. Um, it's funny, I, I ever even questioned being an artist because I think I was just designed to be an artist and I don't think I could ever function in any other way. Um, so when I go through something, I really, everyone feels things. So I don't mean to say that it's uh, that I feel things more than people, but, um, you know, it does affect my, my creativity when I'm grieving, sad, brokenhearted. Um, so the two big artist blocks that I've had have had to do with loss and not to, I've had more, but there's two really big ones. Um, and the way that I dealt with it and it's easier this, the second time around, because I know, I knew I got out of the first one right. and I just always tell myself like, this is in you. You're always going to, you're going to find your way out of it. You're always going to paint. You're going to find your way out of it. Just be patient with it and don't feel guilty. Like that is a huge component, especially my personality, the way I grew up, you know, where my parents, um, they had high standards, which I totally appreciate, but you know, there just was not, I, I'm the kind of person who I don't like to waste time. I feel like I need to be productive. Yeah. So if I'm not creating in the capacity where I feel like I can or should, um, you know, I can feel guilty and that really actually makes the artist block worse. Yeah. So um, I go back to that thing that I mentioned doing studies. Okay. Because okay. It, I take the pressure off and I say, we're not doing big paintings right now. We're not going to try to, you know, wow your <laughs> other people with what I'm making. I'm just going to go to small things, whether it's watercolor studies. Sometimes I try a new media, 
or new medium. Oh, okay. Like uh, last year, last year I, I reintroduced um, or I introduced acrylic, which I hadn't done since college. So you know, if you mix it up, take your, take yourself out of context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that really helps. Like um, one year I did watercolor when I was feeling lost. Um, and then I ended up on this whole watercolor journey, which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, new, uh, new media is great. Doing small scale uh, is really good. And with the small scale, also just not thinking um, product oriented, be process oriented, just let yourself play, let yourself explore. Mm -hmm. And when I had a really bad block in 2016, I had been through a big cha life change and I had actually spent six months in Asia just kind of like regrouping and traveling and I was doing plein air painting which was lovely but then I got back to New York into my studio and I thought what the heck do I do now like my whole life is different I've just been in Asia for six months like mm -hmm. painting mountains and oceans and now I'm in New York and it's really loud and busy <laughs> and I'm lost and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so I just started say, you know, like taking walks every day and, you know, walking helps, seeing new things helps. Um, and one of my walks, I went down to Union Square and I saw a group of singers, like they were, I think they were either Amish or Mennonite. It was like a choir and they were performing. And I was so struck by just seeing a choir in the middle of New York. It yeah. just was really out of context and surprising. So I kind of snuck a few pictures. Um, and then that, that image stayed with me. And then of course it launched the whole singer series that I've been doing for five years, almost six years now. Oh. So, and that I was in an artist block. All I did was these tiny little studies of the singers and I put them away. Yeah. And then, you know, a year later I pulled them out. So I think, I mean, I don't think there's one way to come out of an artist block. I just think you have to write it out and be patient and not be, yeah, my big advice is to not feel guilty for not making big work or tons of work. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't made as much work this year because again, I had a, a, a life change. My mother passed away six mm -hmm. months ago. Oh, um, thank you. And that was obviously a very um, challenging moment and it's been hard to get back into painting, yeah. but as I'm doing it, I'm finding a lot of comfort, but I'm also doing it really intentionally and just, you know, not with pressure. The Madonna painting was really about that kind of contemplative mm -hmm. thinking of the mother figure. Yeah. And, you know, like it was helping me process what's going on in my life. And I think we can let, if we can let it, art, art can, you know, really be a therapy to us. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this, we need to kind of get rid of the guilt get rid of the productivity and and just there are times when you just need to be and and I don't know if that makes any sense but mm -hmm. for me it, it's a, it's a gentle journey and and to let it be that yeah I love that yeah just to be just to um yeah and, and to paint or create just out of being an artist not out of yeah production yeah. Like yeah. Process. yeah. And sometimes as professional artists, we can, uh, or, or, you know, even if you're, you know, um, learning art, but you can lose your joy for it if you get too product oriented or too pressured. Absolutely. Um, and it's important to keep that joy alive in, in your creativity. And that's, it's, that's something I really like about the mission statement of Mastery. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that so much. Um, all right, so I have uh, I've heard that you have a like a wait list of people waiting to buy your work. Um, that's awesome! Congratulations. <laughs> Tell me a bit about that. I imagine that hasn't always been the case, but um, obviously well, you're you're hitting the nail on the head for a large audience. Well, it depends on the series. So yes, my um, my candy paintings have done um, really well. And I, I it's so funny because, you know, I just paint all the time, paint all the time. And then, you know, you never know what's going to hit and people are going to be interested in. And I was very surprised about the candy series. Um, uh, and I, I've thought about it a lot. So I, I started it when I was in Georgia, as I mentioned, kind of looking back from my childhood. So I was painting some American candies. And then when I moved to France, I thought, well, you know, why not? Maybe I should continue that series. 
So I, I thought, well, I can actually start to paint French candies. So I started to ask French people their favorite candies. There's a whole like regional candy culture here in France. It's really <laughs> interesting because they have a culture about a regional culture thing about every kind of food and beverage and cheese. And it's wonderful. But mm -hmm. I started to find out about the sweets in France. And so that became a way of learning about the place that I'm in and the new environment and the new culture, new for me. And so it was, uh, yeah, I was supposed to have a show um, two years ago and it was canceled because of, um, because of COVID and we had a, another lockdown and um, I decided to put it on Zoom. And so many people turned up. I mean, it was like huge. Um, I sold so many of the paintings online, which was crazy. I hadn't sold a lot of work online. And so the candy paintings just kind of took off. And um, I'm not painting as many of them right now, um, but I still I still keep that series going because it really is my most um, popular series. Um, so yeah, that's been a really uh, lovely surprise. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I've had people want to buy ones that have already sold. And then they're like, well, can you still just make it again? My most popular one was I did a Smurf Pez. Um, oh, and I had like, I was like kind of putting the Pez in my mouth. So it's like my mouth and the Smurf. <laughs> and for whatever reason, like everybody wanted that one. Yeah. And so I said, well, I can probably do, you know, another one, like with a different angle, you know, play with it a little. I'll play with this theme. Yes, yes, I can do it again. So, you know, I did that. But there's no, you know, you don't want to do too much of that because right. once a painting has been born, you don't want to like force it to come out again. So, like, <laughs> but yeah, that's been like a really lovely, surprising part of my journey. And again, you never know what's going to take off. Um, other, other series that do well, I did a, um, a drawing series. Um, it, it was called a hundred faces in a hundred days. Mm. And it was again, during, um, the, the confinement here, they call, that's what they called the second lockdown confinement. I know yeah. that's not the term we use in the U S or North America, but, um, anyway, um, we had a curfew at 6 PM every night. Wow. And so I was living alone and, you know, coming home at 6 PM was like kind of sad. And, yeah. you know, I just was sitting in my apartment and I thought, okay, I've got to deal with this because this is depressing. So I thought, well, I'm just going to do a little drawing of someone who inspires me, some artist, musician, literary person, poet, yeah. dancer, whatever. Yeah. So I just started drawing famous faces that resonated with me. And I did a Zoom show. I did a couple of pop-ups with those. And so those sold really well too. Mm -hmm. And people have since asked me, oh, could you do this person? So yeah, it's it's fun. Like I, I don't, there's no formula to know what people are going to love, but I do think it's really important to kind of pay attention when something is resonating. Um, there's a, a fine line. You want to keep that up, but you also don't want to only create for the sake of selling. You know, that can be, right. You know, there's a balance, but um, luckily I, I do feel like I've um, found some subjects that I really love mm -hmm. and there's a lot of ideas I have for them and people like them too. So it's a nice fit for now. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is a tricky balance. Uh, once you find something people love. Um, yeah, and you, you said, I forget the wording, but once a painting has been born, you don't want to re revisit it again and again. Yeah. Tell me yeah. a little bit about, about that. What do you mean? Well, I just feel like, you know, our lives are limited. Um, you know, we're, we're here for a time. And I, you know, just like anything, like I want to be really thoughtful about what book I read, what movie I watch with, you know, time is all, time is our currency. Yes. And I feel the same way about creativity. Like I have a lot of ideas and I want to give voice to them as many as I can. And I just don't want to repeat myself too much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. I, and and that's very true. We we have limited time to create. So um, yeah, yeah. Let's stay on the edge of creating. Hmm. Yeah, things that really really drive you and inspire you and mm -hmm. push you and challenge you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, very good. Um, a comment from uh, oops, where'd it go? Oh, there was one I missed. Anyways, um. 
Oh, here from Teresa, love this, doing studies and experimenting, mixing things up when at a crossroads. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, and I've heard that before too, um, when you feel like you're running out of inspiration or you're getting pigeonholed or feeling mm -hmm. stale, that it might be time to try a new medium is what I've, what I've heard. Yes, I, there is just something about playing you know we need to play uh creatively and to give ourselves permission to do that um you know it's it's really important so i think that that can be very fun and usually when you're playing you're you're not worried about the the end results you're letting yourself explore so yeah that's good. yeah no that's good good reminder yeah um how uh one thing I was wondering about, um, so you you are with Masters as a mentor now, which is uh, fantastic. You have been yeah. teaching already, right? Yes, yes. Tell I've us about teaching for many years. Yeah. Awesome. Tell us about teaching. What what do you love about it? Uh, why you keep doing it? Okay. Yeah, it's actually one of my very very favorite things about being an artist is mm -hmm. getting to share with other people. Um, so as I mentioned, when I was eighteen. You know, it really, I, I took that one art class to paint the white roses and it changed my life. And I really thank my teacher for providing a really safe, supportive, encouraging environment mm -hmm. where he treated me with respect um, and helped me kind of find, find my way with my beginning journey. So I have such a special relationship with teachers. Um, also in New York, I had a, a, a female artist who really took me under her wing and she was a mentor to me. Um, there were a lot of, um, it, it's not a gender thing, but there were a lot of male artists I studied with and it was just like really great to have a, a female artist like really supporting me and, and kind of helping me on my journey. So when I remember the first time I was asked to teach, um, I was subbing for a class at the Art Students League and I was so nervous. Um, but it was, it was just such a rewarding experience of being able to talk about other people's work with them and give ideas. And also I found myself so inspired by the students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really an exchange. Um, that's how I always think of teaching. It's an exchange, mm -hmm. uh, cause I learned so much from students. Um, and also I learned so much from my teachers and now I'm able to share it with other people. Um, and I, there's some there, I, I had a teacher who said this, and I think it's beautiful. He said, I, uh, and when he said I, it was him, not me. He said, I had the, the great privilege of studying with so many artists. It's my moral responsibility to give back to others. Yeah. And I just thought that was beautiful. And it, it, I heard that as a student and it stayed with me. So mm -hmm. I love the, um, connectedness. I, I love the community of teaching, um, art is a lonely practice in many ways because you are in your head, in your studio by yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time alone, which I'm happy to do. I like my bubble, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, it's also very good to connect with others and to talk about art. Like even what we're doing right now is like so inspiring to me mm -hmm. to have a conversation about art and know there's other people listening and chiming in. Yeah, I just think we need that sense of community. And I think the teacher student environment um, can really nurture that on both ends. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're preaching to the choir. We, we community is just so impactful and um, everyone knows my story, but similar to yours, I had a, a mentor and that changed everything for me to know someone cared, right. And was there to help yeah. me, to help me yeah. have an easier, more joyful journey instead of going it alone all the time. Um, yeah. and I love being alone too. Most of us are introverts uh, and we're, we're already isolated, right? Even before the pandemic. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'm just finding again and again how life-giving those relationships are and learning in, in community with people and that, that back and forth give and take, yeah, is powerful. Yeah, yeah, I, I really do love it. Um, it's, it's really special. And it's nice when you work with the same students for a, a while, because you really get to know each other and, you know, their styles. And mm -hmm. um, for me, like, it, I never want someone to feel like they need to paint like me. I have a lot of information that I love to share, yeah. but I really like seeing people's voice emerge and seeing them tap into 
the the kind of work that's meaningful for them to make because mm -hmm. um, that's super rewarding for me to see and to to help with that yeah and, and even for artists to know that that is in them uh, that <laughs> becoming an artist doesn't mean painting like an artist you love but that it's actually in there uniquely and the the joy in the journey is finding it and pulling it out and and honing it and nurturing yes. it right that's so true and and just like making a space where people can do that with confidence yeah um because you know that's really part of it too is mm. feeling like you know you have something to say and it can be said and it can be seen you know that's mm. that's a really good feeling yeah mm -hmm. yeah um we're coming up to the hour we still have a few minutes and i'm wondering um with you have you have years under your belt. Uh, you've walked a long road um, as an artist. You've learned a tremendous uh, amount of things. Um, we have mostly aspiring and emerging artists uh, at mm -hmm. Masterists. What, what, what would your encouragement be to um, uh, aspiring or emerging artists that uh, if, you, if you had known sooner would have benefited you? Put me on the spot. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess if I, I feel like I had a lot of striving to find my voice. I really stressed out about finding my voice. It, it was like a real big stressor. Like when I was in art school and, and drawing from life, you know, that was fine because I knew I had this classical approach, this method, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to practice, and I'm going to mix just the right color. Everything was somewhat formulaic. And mm -hmm. while I'm grateful for that experience, it wasn't my voice, and I had to go out and do it. And yeah, I just, if I'd known that it, to just lighten up, and it's going to be okay, just keep making work, just keep making work. That's really all you need to do is just mm -hmm. show up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Keep on painting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. They say they say it takes how many thousands of hours oh, to be ten thousand hours. 10, I lost my ten thousand hours and then I was like, where's my voice? I don't need <laughs> 10, hours. <laughs> I should be a master by now. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. It, and then it took another ten thousand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I love the idea that um, every hour you paint is one more hour that you that you don't that is behind you, right? So you're you're further along. Yes. Your for every hour is another step forward uh, towards. I like, yeah, yeah. I had a teacher who said something about miles of canvas behind you, and I um, loved that. Just yeah. thinking of. Or I guess here you would say kilometers, but um, <laughs> but yeah, just thinking like, oh yes, there's so much canvas behind me, and you know, as I keep going, the the thing about the journey, not that it's you know about getting better, but we kind of do, we just get we just get better at it because we have more and more experience. Yeah, and it is one of those fields that I think you can enjoy more and more and more the more you go along with it. I think so, so too. Yeah, because yeah. your confidence grows, your work. Uh, your style emerges which is really mm -hmm. uh, edifying right when you you have a style that you know is yours authentically and yes and that's a good word for it it is edifying I like that word yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I've even found um I've been painting for about 12 years but I was doing a demo last week and as I was sharing I learned something about myself because I shared it with the artists that were there was that that my painting my style the really flowy smooth was actually uh like physically cathartic for me it was actually soothing for my body to do the oh. motion which was okay yeah and so I'm like oh, okay so that's part of my style is meant to be soothing and to be feeding me and taking care of me and that sort oh, of thing gorgeous. I had that's never beautiful. realized yeah well, I mean, I, you know, I do think like spirit, body, it's so connected and yeah. there's something about this way of your movement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really beautiful. I love that. Yeah. 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 It was, it was an, an eye opening moment. Uh, cool. Yeah. Hmm. Well, folks, um, we have a few minutes left. If you have any questions for Liz, pop them in the chat. 
And um, again, I mentioned I'm going to stay on after the call to talk a little bit more about Mastrius and about our amazing community and how we're growing together and how uh, you can join the community if you're interested. And also give away a one month events membership um, to someone who sticks around who isn't a member. Yeah. Any questions, folks? Liz, tell us more about your early days as an artist. Um, what's what's kind of the, the worst story or the your biggest discouragement that you had to overcome? Um, let's see. Well, I worked as um, I won't name any names, but I worked as an artist assistant mm. um, for a while. And I just that was really hard to like make someone else's artwork. I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tough job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got paid and I got paid well. It's, you know, so I'm not going to say anything bad, but there was something that just, you know, it was like, this is what I love doing. This is my passion. And I really should be saving this for me, you know, not for someone else. So that was a really difficult moment. I, it, it helped. It got me through some, some times in New York. New York is not a cheap place to live. And it did enable me to, you know, continue my own work. Um, and also I kept reminding myself, I'm getting paid to paint. I'm getting paid to paint. <laughs> so I did my color mixing got really good. So, okay. um, I was able to use it, but it, it was uh, like morally hard for me to like paint for someone else. Yeah. So you were actually doing their, uh, like their underpaintings doing part of their process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was kind of like an atelier, almost like what probably would have been in the, you know, Renaissance when they had like the, from the studio of, except, you know, of course our names never appeared, just the, the main persons. <laughs> okay, fascinating. I couldn't imagine. Well, I'm glad you broke free and, uh, and pursued it yourself. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a means to an end. So, so yeah, but yeah. a difficult well, moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, to be able to make money painting is, is a hurdle. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, this has been a lovely conversation. Uh, Liz, thank you so much. Oh, it's, it's been, been a pleasure. I so appreciate um, the great questions and kind of like your insight and your take on things. And mm -hmm. also the question or the comments have been lovely. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Heather. Yeah. yeah so more comments great. coming up. Great conversation. Thank you so much. This hour has been absolutely delightful. Thank you, Heather. I'm so thank glad. You. Yeah. That's wonderful. I love connecting and hearing uh, your story. I love that each story is unique and I get something and I learn something from each one. So thank you for sharing. Oh, yeah, it's been a true pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much.